Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the CUNY Graduate Center. I'm Karen Sander, the Director of Public Programs. We are so delighted to have you here tonight for this important event. As many of you know, the CUNY Graduate Center is a hub for graduate education for the CUNY system. We grant most of the doctorates and offer many master's programs as well. Since we are a public university, we are extremely focused on sharing knowledge with the public and offer events like tonight's for you to engage and learn with us. We offer most of our programs in person and also online, so I welcome the many of you that are Zooming in from around the world. We're happy to have you with, here with us tonight as well. So much of the research that our faculty and students undertake here at the CUNY Graduate Center focuses on ways we can solve the crucial issues of our time. The Stone Center for Socioeconomic Inequality, our co-sponsor for tonight, is one of the many centers at the Graduate Center that produces groundbreaking research and scholarship. We chose the topic of child poverty for this event for several reasons. It has been shown that child poverty is the root cause for so many other issues in our society. Problems like disparate outcomes in education, health disparities, incarceration, and many more. We have done many public events on these topics, and I encourage you to look at our video archive if you want to delve further into these issues that child poverty eventually leads to. So it seems like we could solve this problem. If we solve this problem, it would eradicate these other problems. And one of the silver linings coming out of the pandemic was a decrease in child poverty due to the child tax credit, which gave families monies throughout the year instead of waiting to receive them as a tax credit when taxes were filed. A simple policy that worked, but unfortunately was not renewed by Congress. So we are here tonight to delve further into the causes of the problems and most importantly, the solutions. It is my great pleasure to introduce our really rock star expert panel here um, who are gonna guide us through this issue tonight. So starting down at the end, we have Dr. Regina Baker, who is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology and a faculty fellow at the Carolina Population Center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Previously, she was an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Baker's research focuses on understanding the factors that shape socioeconomic conditions and disparities across people and places. She's particularly interested in the role of institutional mechanisms in shaping individual outcomes and broader patterns of poverty and inequality, such as child poverty and racial disparities. Sitting next to her, Kathy Eden, is the William Church Osborne Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs at Princeton University. The author of nine books, Eden is widely recognized for using both quantitative research and direct in-depth observations to illuminate key mysteries about poverty. Her most recent book, The Injustice of Place, Uncovering the Legacy of Poverty in America, just came out in 2023. Next to her is Zachary Parolin, is an assistant professor of social policy at Bocchini University and a senior research fellow at Columbia University Center on Poverty poverty and social policy. He has published widely on topics related to the measurement, sources, and consequences of poverty, including his new book titled, Poverty in the Pandemic, Policy Lessons from COVID-19. His recent research has been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, The Economist, The Atlantic, CNN, in a US presidential debate, and in other outlets. Next up is Janet Gornick, is a professor of political science and sociology here at the CUNY Graduate Center, and she is the director of the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality, our co-sponsor for tonight. She is an author or editor of four books and an extensive number of articles. Her, re her research, which is mostly cross-national, concerns social welfare policies and their impact on gender disparities in the labor market, income inequality, and poverty. Recently, she co-edited and contributed to a volume of the annals titled Single Parent Families and Public Policy, Evidence from High-Income Countries. And last is our moderator for tonight, one and only Carol Jenkins. She is a journalist, activist, and author. While serving as president and CEO of the ERA Coalition Fund for Women's Equality, she testified before the House Committee on Oversight and Reform about the impoverishment of women and children in America. 
As a member of the coalition board, she continues to work for amending the Constitution as part of the solution, while singing, singling out her outrage that children go hungry in one of the richest countries in the world. The Invisible Americans podcast that she co-hosts exposes the persistent problems of child poverty. And she is also an Emmy-winning television journalist and currently hosts Black America on CUNY TV, now in, in its eighth season. So I turn it over to you, Carol. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen, for, for everything. Uh, I want to make sure that we are all powered up. Um, I'm assuming that this works uh, a little better, Karen, and thank you so much for all of the terrific programming that uh, you present here uh, at the Graduate Center. And we do have a rock star panel, I want you to know. I am somewhat new uh, to the child poverty uh, crisis, uh, something that I'd always wanted to do. Uh, and you know, we're working on the Equal Rights Amendment and we're 100 years in that fight. And so I had always said to my colleagues in the ERA movement, as soon as we get this, you know, I'm moving on to child poverty. And then when the 100th year came along and it seemed clear that we were not gonna have it in the next five minutes, I said, well, I'll, I'm with you still, but uh, it's time to address the issue of uh, child poverty. Uh, my partner in the podcast, Jeff Madrick, who uh, could not be here tonight and sends his best wishes. He is watching uh, from home. Uh, he wrote a book called Invisible Americans, The Tragedy of uh, the Tragic Cost of Child Poverty. And it's the basis of the work that we do, uh, some 50 uh, conversations that we've had this year. Uh, 25 podcasts and we're doing three convenings, uh, all in the effort of raising this issue in the minds of the, uh, the population that exists in the United States of America so that we can actually get, get something done. So it is uh, my distinct uh, pleasure uh, to be with this esteemed panel. We've interviewed Kathy uh, Eden uh, and we are pursuing Jack and Regina and Janet has been extremely and the work that she does here at the Stone Center has been extremely helpful to the work that we do so we're all we're very appreciative and glad to be in in this company so here as a former reporter uh, and being uh, relatively impatient I've said to the panelists can we start with the solutions, your conclusions, and then work our way backward. So they have graciously agreed to do that. So uh, ending child poverty in the United States of America, which is what we're talking about mostly, and Janet can give us the uh, how we fit into the rest of the world. But many people do not realize when we say child poverty, we're talking about nearly 13 million children in this country who get no attention and who get uh, very little help uh, and we know now what works, so we need to move on to those solutions. So I'm, we're going to start with Janet to give us the perspective. Put us in context. What is your solution for this? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and just to say again, without, I hope it doesn't sound like an excessive love fest, but this is really an honor to be with this panel. And Carol, thank you so much. And the work that you and Jeff are doing to bring this out into the world is crucial. I think that Jeff is one of the first um, people who identifies as an economist who has actually noted that child poverty is really important. And with apologies to my many economist friends, though, that um, he's been a really, really crucial voice. So of course, we're sorry that he's not here and delighted um, that you're here representing the two of you. Um, yes, I'm going to say just a little bit to put us in context. I've done a lot of work, actually 30 some years now, looking at um, socioeconomic outcomes across countries. So I want to just give you a, a very quick portrait of what child poverty looks like in the United States compared to other rich countries, and then tell you very quickly, um, mention five policy um, pathways that would, um, I think research has demonstrated, would, would reduce the child poverty rates in this country. Um, so let me just tell you, I recently did a study, this was just on the eve of COVID, where I looked at child poverty from many different angles comparing the United States to 18 other rich countries, okay? Um, so here are a few numbers. In the United States, this is, I might just add, using what we call a relative poverty rate. Um, we can come back to that in the Q&A if anybody's interested in the details, but basically we compare people's household income to, the, to a portion of the median in their own country. Um, and this is household income after we've accounted for taxation and transfers, so what people have at the end of the day. Okay, in the United States, using this measure, just on the eve of COVID, all Americans, the poverty rate was 17.3%. 
For children, it was 21.1%, and for children under the age of six, it was 24.5%. So our children are the most at risk for poverty. Looking across these other countries, compare that basically 25% of American children under the age of six in poverty. The second highest country in this group was Italy at 18%. That's six percentage points lower. That's huge. Um, another uh, nine countries were between 10 and 18% and the rest were in the single digits down to 4% in Finland. So what's the point of looking across countries that allows us to link poverty rates to institutions? And the punchline is, in many decades of my work and lots of others, uh, a huge body of research concludes that child poverty rates in the United States are highest uh, and higher than in many other countries because as a result of a mix of policies and institutions that have created that poverty. So there are policies and institutions that have created that poverty. Um, I recently co-edited a volume with a lot of international scholars, and Regina and Zachary, Lori Maldonado here, my co-editor, we co-edited a volume of the annals in which we searched for policy lessons across countries. So let me not take too much time, but just tell you what we concluded. This is a group of almost 30 scholars. These are five things that would reduce poverty among children in this country based on many, many years of experience in other countries. We need more. Um, child care and paid leave to secure women's employment. We need to strengthen labor market protections that put a floor under earnings, and that means raising the minimum wage and extending collective bargaining on those two indicators were dead last in the rich world. We need to increase the generosity of income transfers. You cannot make it in the labor market alone. Uh, in, in many, many cases, especially for families, and we need income transfers that are universal to build political support, but that also have an element of targeting on the most vulnerable families. We need to reform taxation so we're not impoverishing the poorest families who are paying a very regressive payroll tax, um, and we need to shore up policies that help, that help, we need to, oh my goodness, oh, you want me to say that all over again? No. <laughs> we need to, sorry, and I know I'm going over. And finally, we need to help families build wealth because income matters, but assets also matter. And on all the policy institutions that help build assets, uh, we're performing poorly as well. We could do a lot better. Great, thank you, Janet. Regina. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, okay. that's it. Um, I just, everything that Janet said, I <laughs> agree with wholeheartedly. Um, I think that policies are very important. Effective policies matter, and things like income supports, and um, you know, support for childcare, and, and things like that, that, that are, that definitely makes a difference, and we see it on Crash Nationally. But I wanna take it a step further, because um, when we think about child poverty and the high poverty in the U.S., you know, oftentimes people are like, okay, why is child poverty worse in the U.S., right? And single mothers is often, um, single motherhood is off family structure differences is, is often, you know, it's also often attributed to that. Um, and at the same, same vein, if you look at differences across race, and that's an area of mine, right, we see the same explanation being used, right? Oh, it's, it's, poverty is higher among you know, black and Latino children because there's a, you know, higher um, single motherhood. Um, and I think there is where I think it's important to, to think about and think about policies is that it's not all about individuals, right? Individuals matter and, and their decisions matter, right? And they're not inconsequential, but we have to think about differences that we see and why do we see these differences? And it's very important to contextualize these differences. And for me, I think to, to have effective solutions to poverty and child poverty, we have to really understand the context, right? And understand the differences and why they exist in the first place. And for me, I think institutional mechanisms and historical mechanisms and understanding that, um, if we don't um, put that on the forefront and we don't really um, address those, then we're kind of, you know, it's like a dog chasing its tail, right? Um, so I think that's important. Understanding and contextualizing um, is very key to even, um, to, to effectively address these issues. Great, thank you. Catherine. Kathy. Kathy? You can call me Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you, Kathy. you're my mother and I'm in trouble. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for hosting this conversation. It's just wonderful to see how much energy you're putting into uh, these issues. Um, so we made a, a, a fundamental error in 1996. Uh, what we did is we uh, began a process um, where we transferred our safety net from the bottom fifth of American families with children to the second fifth of American families with children. We slashed 
uh, need-based welfare. We added the EITC, which of course is only fully enacted when you're working full-time, full year. It only gets you out of poverty when you're working full-time, full year. And uh, in that dramatic transformation, uh, what we did is put all of our eggs in the basket of the low-wage labor market, which after about 1999 got considerably more perilous uh, for low-income workers in general and mothers of children in particular. And so what you see it, when you look at the poverty rate, especially the, you know, that we could have the poverty rate wars here, uh, the SPM, the one that takes uh, account of cost of living changes and, and, um, and uh, things like the EITC, we see uh, you know, since 2000, the story of poverty declining. Uh, but at the same time, we see a story of hardship increasing. So we have a record number of homeless children as reported in their schools, and that number has been increasing steadily, uh, except, you know, I'm only talking through 1999 because I'm going to save the, the fun part of this for Zach. Uh, so, a little dip in that very, very good economic year of, of 2019, we see an increase in non-mortgage debt among low-income families with children, monotonic increase. We see an increase in uh, ho housing burden among low-income families with children. Uh, we see a, a dramatic increase in the number of families that are forced to sell plasma to survive, one of the main survival strategies we talked about uh, in our book, $2 a Day. Uh, and I could go on and on. Now, there's been some good news with food insecurity and so on, uh, but what we see there is a dramatic increase during the Great Recession and an improvement only when you get a very, very tight labor market. So our children, uh, first of all, even when poverty looks like it go, it's going down, our children are suffering. And part of that is because uh, this transformation of the safety net created winners and losers Right, the winners are the full-time, full-year workers, and the losers are everybody else. And so that's why you can see poverty going down and hardship going up. Uh, that all changed with the pandemic, as I'm sure Zach will tell you, when the numbers started going the same direction. But it's very interesting to see this complicated portrait. Uh, so, as Janet said, and as Regina concurred, putting all of our eggs in the basket of the, the low-wage labor market is disastrous. And uh, children will suffer when we do that, even when the official numbers show progress. One other thing that we're not talking about, that is you can map child poverty by county and you will see dramatic differences by region. The highest rates of child poverty are not in Chicago, they're not in New York, they're not in San Francisco, they're in the historic tobacco and cotton belts of the United States. They're in South Texas. They're in Appalachia, and they're in our native nations. And these rates are many times higher in some cases uh, than for the nation as a whole. So any kind of solution uh, to end child poverty must be a relentless new war on child poverty focused on the regions of greatest need. And, and Regina, you alluded to history. And of course, I could show you a map of enslavement, uh, the, the rate of enslaved persons in 1860, and I can show you today a, a map of child poverty. It's the same map. It is the same map. Even the gradations by county are the same. And we do want to talk more about your book. Uh, uh, actu actually, uh, totally shocking in many, many ways, uh, and a lot there. But uh, Zach, let's have you give us your solutions. And as you say, and we all realize, we all learned so much during the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks, Kathy, for allowing me to talk about the good news, uh, the, the temporary <laughs> good news uh, before it became bad news. But no, first, I, I want us to go back in time for a minute to uh, the Great Recession, or the financial collapse that happened around uh, 2008, 2009. Uh, from about 2007, so pre-crisis, to the peak of that particular crisis, say 2011, the poverty rate, the child poverty rate in the U.S. climbed, I wrote it here, about 15% about to 18%. So we saw a notable increase in child poverty during the Great Recession. Now, as the economy recovered over the subsequent decade, by 2019, we actually had 
a high child poverty rate, but historically low, let's say, which for the U.S. is still quite high. When the, the pandemic hit, the, in April 2020, the unemployment rate spiked to about 19%. We might have expected that poverty and child poverty in particular was about to climb as well. But as probably most of you are familiar with, the federal government stepped in in extraordinary ways through a variety of policy experiments and demonstrated what is possible when Congress and the federal government acts to attempt to reduce poverty. In 2020, we saw child poverty not go up from the prior year, not stay the same, but decline. In 2021, it declined further to 5.1%, the lowest child poverty rate on record in the US, and that dates back to 1967. Now, the bad news, 2022, it rebounded. It more than doubled from its prior year, basically returning back to pre-crisis, pre-COVID, levels. So what happened in 2021? Well, a few things, but the most fundamental policy change that occurred that year was the expansion of what's called the child tax credit, which in short made this payment available, a monthly payment uniquely, available to most families with children in the U.S., even if they were not working. And as Kathy said, that is a dramatic shift from the way that we've been treating parents with children over the two decades prior. So I just want to highlight a few uh, facts uh, of research evaluating this child tax credit that, that I've been a part of with colleagues at, at various institutions, and I'll summarize uh, some of our, our findings, and maybe we ret return to some of these later. The child tax credit, when it was expanded and provided to most families with children in the U.S., cut the monthly child poverty rate immediately by about a third. It contributed to the lowest annual child poverty rate on record in the U.S., it cut food hardship by around 25% among low-income families with children. We have evidence from credit and debit card data that it increased families' consumptions on things like childcare centers and food and children's clothing. Uh, no evidence that it increased spending on tobacco or alcohol for whatever that's worth. We have evidence that in 2021, the U.S. went from having a child poverty rate twice that of Germany's to on par with Germany's in 2021. The American welfare state was reducing child poverty at a rate of Norway and Belgium temporarily in 2021, compared to being half as effective uh, as Norway in the years prior. And we don't find any evidence of strong declines in employment among parents uh, when that policy was enacted. That could be different in the long run if this were made permanent. We can talk about how much we should care or not about some of that. Uh, but we find evidence that there were not many parents dropping out of the labor market as a result of this being in place. The policy worked, and then it ended, and child poverty went right back up. So I know tonight we'll talk about what it takes to bring this back, uh, how to pay for it, is it worth bringing it back, but this is what the evidence suggests occurred in 2021. Right. Well, thank you all for, uh, for setting the stage uh, for us. <clears throat> and I think that it was in September when the census report came out. Uh, and uh, showed how, what the dramatic increase in child poverty. And, you know, from our point of view, we were, like, astonished that it was actually covered on MSNBC and CBS and, you know, other mainstream. It was in the New York Times. People were paying attention. What? You know, we have a problem of child poverty. So, I mean, that was, you know, at the expense of these millions of children who then you know, we're on the brink of starvation again and homelessness and all of that uh, and had a brief spurt <laughs> of attention and then uh, subsided again. So uh, somewhat out of order of questioning, I, I just want to ask you why you think that that is, you know, that, that this country refuses to pay attention to this issue, refuse, refuses to to place pressure, enough pressure, on the elected officials. As someone described, you know, said to me, well, you know, Celinda Lake has done the research, and she said, America wants to feed its children. We're, America is for this, but you have a few, you know, men stand, you know, in a cloakroom in Washington, D.C., making these decisions, and therefore millions of children starve. So why this, does this country, Regina, I'm going to start with you, allow, do you think, this to happen. Ooh, so many. <laughs> That's a like. A, uh, I think. Well, one simple reason is just. I think about. You know, we see from 
other models from other countries what can be done and what what has been done and what what works right and I think that unfortunately at the end of the day when you had mentioned like you know you have these you know who's making these decisions right even though Americans by and large they think okay child poverty is an important issue to address but who are the ones in charge who are the ones making the decisions right and I think that you know part of it is you know the a lot of people in charge just don't have that the political will to, to want to, to want the to will, do it, right? Will. And you think about also, I think it's important. And if we have issues like poverty or inequalities in general, there's that question of who's benefiting from the poverty, who's benefiting from the inequalities, right? And I think that's an important important question as well, right? And you can go, you can all tie into like thinking about power dynamics and things like that, um, but. I think that's a, a, a big part of it, right? And when you have people who are in office and they are, their main goal is to just be voted again, <laughs> when the solution to something might be to go against, you know, maybe what um, others and, you know, <laughs> might want you to do in your party. But I think that, again, going to that the political will thing as well. Um, but yeah, I think that's the big part of the story, right? Um, and having people in charge who are so far removed from the situation themselves, right? I remember seeing a pie, a pie chart one time and it was showing like the percentage of Congress who are like millionaires <laughs> or, or percentage who have, you know, the, the family background. And it's just, that's, how are they, um, you know, if, if, if that's their main thing, their mind, mindset, if, if, you know, if, if they're so far removed from the people who are actually impacted by poverty on the day to day, then the decisions aren't going to be, you know, I think, um, good ones at the and end of the day. All right? right, exactly. Anybody else want to jump in? Janet, you're? Uh, I, yes, I would jump in. I think um, I, I'm not a scholar of public opinion, and I mean, there are people who actually study this with data, what people really believe, but I've been around a long time, I've read a lot, and I've, I've listened to a lot of discussions, and I think a couple of things. Americans, I mean, this is a, a, a generalization, but it's really true, certainly relative to other countries. Americans are very skeptical of government. You know, it's just a very, it's very, very Skeptical of, of government. Government, government right. spending, public right. sector employment, any, any indicator of sort of a large government, despite the fact that, of course, we know we have very intrusive social policy, of course, in, in certain areas. But there's a kind of, you know, relative to public opinion in many European countries, there's a skepticism of public spending. There's a, you know, this, we hear a lot of stuff against childcare because we don't want the government raising our children and intruding on parental rights. And all of those are, you know, buzzwords for, for anti-government. I think um, Regina said something really important, which is also this perception that if I give money, I'm taking care of other people's children. Some of that is true in the sense that we have such a fragmented social policy system with a lot of means testing that you know goes back to the 1930s and earlier. So in fact, we do have poor children and not in the same systems that middle class and affluent children are in, um, whereas in a lot of European countries, many of these programs are universal. Um, that it's just two very quick things to say that, and, and I'm agreeing with all my colleagues here, I'm sure we'll find some disagreement eventually, but you know, the <laughs> child tax credit that um, Zach was talking about, you know, we have that in most European countries. It's called something else. It's called a child allowance or a family allowance. I mean, that instrument that we were so shocked by in the United States, you know, everybody in the world in any other rich country knows that that reduces child poverty with a flick of a pen. Why don't we look abroad? Um, because we're, you know, American exceptionalism, we're the city on the hill, we don't need to look abroad, which is a terrible mistake because that's where all the policy lessons are. And one reason we don't look abroad is, as Regina said, is because we think poverty is rooted in individuals and not in institutions, and it all becomes very circular. So I think most Americans who did learn about the child tax credit were astonished, and those of us in the field, forgive me, were not at all astonished because we've seen the child tax credit in action for decades and decades in other countries. And we, and we should say Jeff, who was not here, was among uh, the first, as, uh, as you've said, who believed that this was going to happen and funded some of the research. And people, I guess it was Luke who was uh, Schaefer, uh, a co-author with uh, Kathy on Injustice of Place, who said, um, who was told when he wrote, let's try this child tax credit, was told it's not going to work. You know, it'll never happen. Kathy, do you want to? You know, uh, so we've been embedding field workers in these places. Is your, mic, is your mic on? Can we? Let's, let's leave. I think we can leave them on for. There we go. Okay. We've been embedding field workers in these places of greatest need. 
Um, so, you know, the Cotton Belt, South Texas, um, Tobacco Belt, Central Appalachia. And uh, these places are rife with big problems. Corruption is higher in these, some of these places than anywhere in the country. Violence is at unprecedented levels in these places. And yet when you ask community leaders what the biggest problem is, almost without exception, they say, it's those poor people and how they behave. And this is even, this is a, you know, this is, it's just about race, but it's also about class. You see the same narrative, um, mostly the same narrative in central Appalachia than you see in the Mississippi Delta. We've been engaging for 300 years in America in an experiment. And the experiment, uh, our hypothesis is that if we shame the poor, if we make poverty as miserable as possible, we will have fewer poor people. And, uh, you know, we, that hasn't worked out. So I, I, I do think this American narrative of behavior and mor morality, moralism, much of Regina's work speaks to this, uh, especially around race. Family structure is, it has sort of poisoned uh, our ability uh, to think about how to move our country forward. Zach, you want to add to that? I, I'll just uh, echo a couple points and expand a little bit. I, I really believe that to understand why the U.S. has such a weak welfare state compared to other countries, we have to bring in racism into the discussion. Kathy mentioned this, Regina's uh, done a lot of work on this as well, that to, if we go back to welfare reform and some of the dialogue about ending welfare as we know it, the, in the media and, and political discourse, there were heavily racialized discussions and, and depictions of individuals receiving cash assistance from aid to families with dependent children. You can look at survey evidence and see that racialized perceptions of who receives these benefits, even if they are false in terms of who's actually receiving the benefits, is a very strong predictor of someone's support for quote unquote welfare or not. Even when we talk about expanding the child tax credit, we often go back in, at least, again, in media and political dialogues, to some of these, again, false narratives about who's more likely to receive this. What if some types of groups uh, are more likely to drop out of the labor market? Returning to these same conversations we've had. And you can see evidence of this even in modern day programs. So temporary assistance for needy families, or TANF, which is what we got out of welfare reform in, in the 1990s. If you look at the states that are giving much less on cash assistance and much more to try to influence family structure, it's the states with a higher share of black residents. That racism is embedded into these policies, exacerbating racial differences in child poverty actively today. So to understand why we have such a weak welfare state compared to other countries, I, I think my colleagues have shown in their work, and, and I think it's quite essential that we bring race and really racism race. into the discussion. Without question. You know, early in the, in the podcast series, we interviewed uh, Brian Green, who runs the Houston Food Bank. Um, they feed a million people, uh, two-thirds of whom are working at least one job and most are working on two jobs. And what he said was that when he was a young man and started in that field, he thought, oh, we'll just get enough food and we'll feed everybody and the problem will be over. And he said, no, it just gets bigger and bigger because we have not addressed the underlying socioeconomic issues of what these people who have to line up to feed their families food are already working two jobs, sometimes three, and still cannot make ends meet. So that underlying, uh, for, for the economists here, that underlying system, the structure that we exist in now, I mean, we can feed children, we can give them the child tax credit, but we don't do anything yet about what it is that is making their families poor, you know, and not able to, you know, exist in, in a dignified way. Uh, so at the rock bottom of this, um, Regina, uh, anybody have addressed that in terms of how and when we get to decent minimum wages and decent housing and, you know, the other things? I mean, we'll, you know, we'll do the taking care of them now, but how do we fix the problem? Let me just add a couple of things. Oh my gosh, there's so much to say. Sorry, I thought I stayed on. There's so much to say here. I just want to go back for one second. As I'm listening to my colleagues here, I, you, you, it keeps, I realize we're all saying the same thing from a slightly different perspective. There is a, bit, 
on the cultural issue in the question, there's a very strong narrative in the United States that one's children are one's own children. They're yours to take care of. You had them, you feed them. Other people's children are other people's children. Racism is a big part of that story. Inequality is a big part of that story. We have an extremely large, the United States is way beyond other countries in terms of having private schooling, private health care, you know, gated communities at the top, private transportation. Uh, my dear friend and colleague, Nancy Fulbright, a great feminist economist, um, made this comment years ago that many people have borrowed, that Americans think of children as pets. Um, you know, you, you sort of, you had them, you took care of them, they're your children concern. Children as pets? Children as pets. American <laughs> thinks, Americans think of children as pets. That, you know, you had it, you feed it, you take care of it, you reap the joy, it's your private business. Whereas, obviously, overgeneralizing in other countries, especially in the social democratic countries, people think of children as public goods. Our children are all of our children. And even in a practical sense, our, everyone's children, that's our labor market of the future. You know, that's our... Those are, but this idea that, um, and this has all been reinforced, I think, on the right with this parental rights. We saw this in Virginia, a lot of it during COVID. Glenn Youngkin won the governorship in Virginia on the program of do not tell any parent anything about their children. Uh, you can't tell them to wear a mask. You can't tell them to be vaccinated. You can't tell them to go to school. So this idea that our children are only our own concern, people seem to take pride in that in the United States. And it has a terrible, I don't think that that's the ultimate reason, but it seems to have a terrible effect on our inability to embrace this as a national issue. Yeah, so it's a rethinking of the family and of the child, because it's one thing to to hold hate in your heart for someone who's not working. It's another thing to hold hate in your heart for the child who's not being fed. You know, um, <laughs> uh, just just in, in, incredible. Uh, Regina, did you want to uh, add yeah, to that? Well, one thing I was thinking about, I'm just through everybody talking and thinking about, you know, why America is the way it is, and thinking about, you know, individualism and, this, and meritocracy and this idea that, you know, if you work, just work hard. You know, you work hard, and, and so if you... You know, I think there's this, this, among some people, there's this feeling that, like, if you say, okay, there's a child poverty is an issue because there's some underlying structural problem, right, or something systemic going on or discrimination happening, then that means that, okay, well, everybody doesn't have equal opportunity. And I think that's important, right? You know, and, and, and by saying that, then they're saying, okay, well, if everybody doesn't have equal opportunity, that means that maybe some people are getting a leg up or some people are, are privileged or, or, or whatnot. Um, and I think that's an issue too, um, the fact that it's kind of counter to the whole idea of the American dream, that if you just like work hard, you can, you can make it. Um, and I think that's an important thing to, to think about in this discussion as well. I, I was uh, intrigued by, as I was grabbing my water, but I was also <laughs> intrigued by, by a paper uh, on the, uh, that you wrote for the Stone uh, Center with a headline, uh, something like, are black women responsible for the child poverty problem? I, I, I don't have that quite right, but it was, you know, I know black women are, are you know, accused of doing wonderful things, saving the democracy, et cetera, but now we're, are, we're accused of creating child poverty. Tell us a little bit about that paper and your surprise revelations. Uh, yeah, so that, the, I remember the headline was like, our single mother is responsible for their, you know, um, um, poverty. And so, um, so for that paper, um, I, me and my colleague, I'm Heather Connell at um, LSU, um, we basically, you know, we, we're, we're interested in this, you know, this idea about, you know, it's all about family structure and, and, and marriage as being the solution to poverty. And we, we, we look at this by focusing on specifically the, the U.S. South, right? Um, and we wanted to tie that into thinking about historical racism and, and structural racism as something to think about um, when we think about these issues, not often talked about. Or, um, and so basically what we, what we find or what we do is we, um, we look at um, um, both, both I think it's complicated analysis, but we look at um, the legacy of slavery, right? So we're looking at the concentration of slavery um, across states at the state level, and we also do a separate county level. Um, and so basically by saying, you know, um, a, a state has had a high number of, a high concentration of enslaved people, essentially thinking about their ties to slavery and its historical racism, right? And we are interested in how um, that concentration, um, how that impacted um, inequality and poverty among single mothers and uh, also among married households with children, right? And what we find is that living in 
a area with a high concentration of, of poverty, um, we find that it's more consequential, um, sorry, a high concentration of slavery, we find that um, there, is this, there is an impact, um, but we find that the impact is stronger among um, married black people, right? So essentially being in a area that had stronger ties of slavery exacerbates poverty um, for um, married, married married household children. And we think this is important because there's so much rhetoric surrounding it's all about single motherhood, right? Um, and if you just get these families you know, married or these, you know, these women married, that'll be the solution. And for us, it's like even, or one thing that I often talk about as well is if it's all about single motherhood, then why do we see differences in poverty among married households of children, right? We see racial differences across groups, right, around married people. So if it's married, this marriage is a solution, why is this, right? Or in other work that I've done with my colleague, Dedrick Williams, you know, and, you know, we um, you know, look at white mothers, Latino and, and black mothers, and we look at their different risks to poverty, and so it's like, you know, it could be a social risk, you know, um, economic risk, so like, are they employed, unemployed, unemployed, do they have health risk, um, social risk, like is there, um, you know, thinking about conservation and things like that. And basically we find that, you know, like in terms of thinking about number of risk, right, like one prime example I think about is that a white, you know, mother, white single mother with three poverty risks has a, is less likely to be poor than you know a black mother with you know who's married and has zero poverty risk, right? And so I think studies like this are important because they you know essentially highlight the fact that it's not all about family structure because if it was we wouldn't see you know the the, the patterns that we see. Um, in that regard. And so I think that's important, you know, we think about these things, thinking about context and um, history and things that matter, um, because clearly they do. Um, and one last thing, and another current paper I'm working on um, with Dave Brady and, and Ryan Finnegan, you know, we, we find that, um, you know, we do these different models where we can say, okay, if, pov if single motherhood were this rate, what would happen to the child poverty rate? Um, and we do that. Um, looking cross-nationally as well as within the U.S. And so, for example, if poverty rates, if single motherhood rates were zero in the U.S., right, the U.S. would only fall from being the third worst in, in poverty among 30 rich democracies to the sixth worst, right? It still would be bad, <laughs> right? So then we're like, okay, let's look at just, you know, the U.S., right, and just look at across race because the same reasons why we hear poverty is higher in the U.S. is the same reasons why we hear poverty is higher among certain groups. And we said, okay, we, we you know, we changed the, the single motherhood rate, and in, in the case where single motherhood was zero, you know, even though the child poverty rates might have decreased like a couple of percentage points across the board, we find that black and Latino children, like the poverty rates are still double, or I think or triple white children if single motherhood were zero, right? And, and so again, and, just more evidence. And we recommend that you go to the Stone Center for the full report, fascinating information. Can I add one sentence to what she just said? Yes. I know we're all dying to say, just to underscore what Regina just said, we've been here, we hear a lot about this. I always say, if I, had, if I had, I don't know, a nickel for every time I've heard in the United States, but don't we have high child poverty in this country because we have such a high rate of single mothers compared to other countries? And of course, you also hear the other nickel I would like to have each time I heard is, and, and it's an epidemic, single parenting is skyrocketing in this country. Those are both completely false. So the rate of single parenting or children in single parent families in the United States compared to all these other countries with much lower child poverty is right in the middle of the pack and it hasn't risen a bit in 30 years, it's come down. So those are two completely false narratives that Regina has done a good job putting the nail in that coffin, but not everybody's, <laughs> read, not everybody's reading it. Put, it. put a nail in that coffin. But the one thing, uh, Janet, in your study about, about women's uh, earning power, uh, uh, also at the Stone Center, if you want to read this uh, depressing uh, news, uh, and that is not just in this country, but in many countries, that this idea of uh, poverty is related to the fact that women still earn less than men do uh, at low these many, many years. Do you want to briefly just say, and as I said to Janet, you know, in the report, uh, you know, then they nonchalantly say, and it's not going to change, you know, and I thought, wait a minute, you know. <laughs> Well, first of all, just to say the issue, I mean, everybody is saying this, but the American labor market is very inhospitable uh, to virtually to, you know, anybody in the lower quarter of the earnings distribution. The American labor market is really, um, is failing a lot of families and their children. And it's that's not just a gender issue, but it's absolutely true that we also look at, I was mentioning those poverty numbers at the beginning where we look at 
at poverty based on income after taxes and transfers, but if we look at income transfers, and if we, we can do the same thing, which we all do, is also look at the poverty rate if, you know, before the tax and transfer, just based on what people bring from the labor market. Um, there, the U.S., that type of poverty is also very high in the U.S. because our, our labor, for two reasons. One is that the work and family policy is really poor, and our women's employment rates are actually not good. It's not as much the earnings as the employment rates that are lagging, and they drop in and out when they have children because the supports for continuous employment are weak. Um, but the second, so the labor market is, is failing, I should say, let me just say that both families, um, and that's true of both women uh, and men, is true in single parent families and in coupled families. The labor market um, is failing American families and their children. That's why on, no matter how hard people work in this country, you work full year, full time, uh, one or two parents with two children and you're still poor. That's why we need an income tax and a transfer system that supports it. So the labor market is really a lot at fault in this country. It's not just a question of poor redistribution. Right, right. Well, didn't the, I think it was one of the, the major papers that had a story about the new trend of people actually living in their cars. And one of the people they profiled was making, I think, like $70,000 and still could not... Uh, for whatever her financial situation was, actually uh, live indoors in a traditional housing. So it's now a thing, you know, where they're creating parking lots uh, where people are can rent space in a parking lot and live in their live in their cars. So that's a, the part of it. Catherine, or Kathy, I want to talk about your book because we're using a lot of the of what you would call I think the old language in terms of talking about poverty if you can tell us some of the measures that you took uh, in injustice of place and what you think the new terminology should should be the way we should look at well first let me say that our other co-author Timothy Nelson is also here so uh, Luke Schaefer is probably watching uh, so we're all here in one way or another but um, There are, if you know anything about poverty or the studies of child poverty, the poverty wars are endless. How do we measure this? Nobody can agree. And, and when you try to change the official measure, you get really strange results, like California becomes poorer than Mississippi. So, um, you know, we, we came up with those measures many, many years ago in the 1960s out of expediency because we were launching a war on poverty. And since then, our nation's infrastructure has grown dramatically. So uh, in our book, we propose a new way of measuring poverty, one that incorporates income-based measures that are cyclical. You know, they rise and fall with the economy. Accumulative measures, uh, namely health, because uh, the experience of disadvantage gets under your skin and you may still be sick or live a shorter life, even if you escape from poverty when you're older. And uh, then, of course, um, structural, uh, structural uh, measures, which measure the level of opportunity in a place. And, and if we map, um, if, if we rank every place in the nation using this, this multi-dimensional measure, we see the, we, the child poverty map and this map are extraordinarily similar. Uh, so there are, uh, what is making children hurt? It's a broad range of factors that are clustering in certain places that contain um, more of our most disadvantaged city, uh, citizens than other places. And I really want to emphasize this place point. So, you know, 60% of uh, black Americans live in the South. And that clustering in the cotton and tobacco belt, those are majority, uh, many of them are majority black uh, communities. We see it in South Texas. 44% of, of Hispanic Americans live in the states along the border. And they're really hurting there. We see this among the poorest whites in the nation, which of course are in Central America, and we see it uh, in our in our native nations. So uh, these are these are deep problems. In some ways, the child poverty is uh, the canary in the coal mine, and many times you can trace these same patterns back dozens of decades. In, indeed, these are the same communities that gave the war on poverty its face. These are also the communities that generated most of America's wealth. Uh, they were also the places where there was a deeper level of human exploitation and resource extraction than in any other place in the United States. 
So, um, you know, we, we, wanna, we wanna think about child poverty in all of these ways, uh, but I think we're gonna still have that same map. Uh, the second thing is that we suggest in our book a language change because place profoundly determines how kids do in the life course, where they grow up, and they don't choose where they grow up. And so we introduce the term disadvantage um, because it implies uh, an injustice. It's a moral term. It suggests that children are being held back unfairly. So I guess two things that we offer is, is this idea of really looking at a child poverty in a more multidimensional way. Uh, and and in, in doing so, uh, to really understand how it is regionally patterned. And, and second, could we escape the, the, the blame trap you know, the, by inserting a term that more accurately describes what is going on, and that is disadvantage rather than, than poverty. This, this notion that people are, children are being held back unfairly because of the places they grow up. Not because of their own decisions, not because of their behavior, not because of the quality of health care in a place, but because of the, of the neighborhoods and, uh, and, and communities that grow up in. Well, it, it's, it's a wonderful book, and we've interviewed uh, Kathy and Luke and Timothy, and it's on the next Invisible Americans podcast. It'll be up on Thursday. Uh, Zach, I've been reading some of the conversation that you and uh, David Brady have been having about this. I mean, because one of the, as we talk about the way the child tax credit is given, you know, the ch often the children who need it the most don't get it at all. Even, you know, the expanded version was wonderful. Uh, but because there wasn't the work requirement and poor children could actually benefit. Uh, and it was given monthly, you know, because that's my theory. Give, give cash, you know, <laughs> that's the solution. Ask few questions, give as much cash as you have, and let mothers and fathers raise their, raise their children. But you, in a dialogue with David, talked about um, the hardship uh, that falls upon children who uh, are impoverished in the very earliest of their lives. And I know that David Brady has said, you'll live a shorter life because of that. So talk to us a little bit about that. I know that that's deep in your heart about the, the, the unfairness of that. Yeah, thanks. So there's a couple of ways that we can think about the, the long run costs of being exposed to poverty, say at birth or early in your childhood. We have a term we often use in our world called intergenerational persistence of poverty or if you grow up poor, what's your likelihood of also being poor as an adult in, in the US? And with some colleagues, we've been doing some work to understand if you grow up poor in the US, not only what is your likelihood of being poor in adulthood, but how does that compare to other uh, high income countries? We have data for Germany, we have data for, for Denmark, we have data for the United Kingdom and, and more. And we can evaluate this, this question, and we find empirically that growing up poor in the US is so much more costly than even growing up poor in, say, the UK or, or Canada. Growing up poor in the US is more strongly manifesting in not being able to go and get a decent uh, job or get a university degree. It's, it's associated with stronger health challenges in uh, adolescence than in other countries. And these have not just long-term costs for the individuals affected, but long-term costs for our society as well. And there's th ways we can think about it. There's the moral question, which I think is the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, how unfair is it that just being born into the wrong place or to the wrong family should lead to all these disparate outcomes? If you want to approach it from a purely rational economist point of view, we can do that too and say that this is extraordinarily costly due to the income taxes that these people aren't going to pay as high as they would if they were had better opportunities than not, the additional money we'll have to spend on this, this, and this. So regardless of if, whether you want to view it from a moral lens or a purely rational econom economist lens, there are wonderful justifications for investing our nation's resources into ending child poverty, uh, one, but also eradicating poverty among the youngest children in this country. And one more point, if I may, on, on this. Uh, we can't, again, talk about this with, without noting the racial differences in exposure to child poverty as well. So I've shown in some of our work that black children in the US are exposed to about four times the rate of poverty throughout their childhoods relative to white individuals. And so if we want to talk about why the average, uh, let's say, black 30-year-old has greater likelihood of poverty than the average white 30-year-old, 
We don't need to go to family structure. We don't need to go to a number of other indicators that get brought up a lot these days. We can look at how their, their economic situation as far back as childhood and think of the situation that our state, our country, put them in when they were born and follow the path that leads to the disparate outcomes we see in adulthood. Yeah, and, and interestingly too, Dr. Harnett at uh, Harvard, I believe, has uh, looked at the data of a group of young black boys uh, studying their brains, and uh, apparently the research uh, shows uh, absolute physical change in the structure of the brain, you know, in those areas that may give them complications later, learning, uh, et cetera. So the good news is apparently it can be remediated uh, to some extent, but poverty and racism is not just an abstract thing. It's a physical harm, uh, you know, to, uh, to children. Janet? Can I make a plug for, for public universities? I'd like to say, I do just want to say that this is absolutely correct, and there's been some devastating research in recent years about the lifelong effects of early child, of poverty among children, and I don't doubt that at all. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's very persuasive. I was on a panel some years ago with Jim Heckman, a, um, a well-known economist, a conservative economist, I think it's fair to say, Nobel laureate, um, who uh, nevertheless was very important in arguing for the importance of investing, right, in preschool for a lot of the, as Zach is sort of hinting, partly for instrumental reasons. Um, and on the panel, I started to make the case for, um, for, for a public university. I mean, I have been a CUNY professor for 30 years. Um, and he basically said, if he's listening, I, I hope I'm quoting you properly, he said, it's too late at that point. It's way too late. And in fact, um, it, it, um, public funds for, for universities should be redirected towards children. Well, I do want to say it's not too late, because one thing we've learned in recent years has come from this very interesting research on social mobility based on colleges. Raj Chetty has done this and many others. They created the Social Mobility Index. Um, Roz Chetty being able to link tax data with university data scored every single college in the entire United States on this index and that was the percentage of young people who came from the bottom fifth of income who ended up as adults in the top fifth of earnings. Six of the top ten schools were CUNY colleges, yes. yes. Um, <laughs> public education, uh, amply funded public education matters enormously. It is not too late. It's, it's an obscenity to give up on people because they're past the age of six. Um, and I think that's really something we need to understand. Funding for university education has been decimated in recent years, another place where we differ enormously from most European countries. Great, great. Well, we're going to continue the conversation, but we uh, would like to take some questions from the audience. We do have a mic uh, traveling around. Uh, here's a hand right here in the front row. Thank you, everyone. Um, my question has to do with Melissa Kearney's book, um, Two Parent uh, Privilege. And, you know, in, 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 in an economist that wrote a bit a controversial book, gets back to Regina's argument on family structure. Um, in fairness to her argument, she's arguing for all those things that you are, income transfers and, and all sorts of things. Um, but I'm wondering what your take, does it hurt or help our end goal to end child poverty, to think about like this two-parent privilege and family structure. Kathy? You know, we have been having this conversation for 40 years, so it is hardly new. <laughs> um, but I, I think we, we've learned a lot about um, why people do and don't get married, parents do and don't get married, and uh, there's a series of very good papers that have come out in the aftermath of welfare reform uh, that shows if you in, if you uh, in, increase people's economic prospects, reduce their uh, their vulnerability even slightly, uh, many more of them will marry than is otherwise the case. So, uh, what's the chicken and what's the egg? Uh, is the, all of all of the things we're talking about here um, reduce hope, reduce certainty that you can you can bet on something? And you know, I spent half my career studying single parenthood. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've written about two books about the topic. Uh, and it, it, it's really about, um, can I make a promise I can keep? Right? Can I make a promise I can keep? Uh, it, you know, I don't want to get married just to get divorced. I don't want to sully the institution with a divorce. And we have made that question more and more perilous. The answer to that question is more and more uncertain. So what is the chicken? And what is the egg? And, and again, I, Christina Gibson Davis has a, a very nice paper 
uh, looking at, at data from the, the you know, the, we did uh, marriage policy for a while in this country under both Obama and Bush. And find so that when, when people have just a little bit of gain in their economic process, a little bit more stability, you see much higher rates of marriage. So um, that would be my comeback. Right, also in the front row right here. Right here. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm getting back to early childhood education after 35 plus years because I'm still recovering from my public education. Have you heard of John Gatto? He was voted New York State Teacher of the Year three times. He wrote a book on the origin of public education in 1900, sponsored by Carnegie and Rockefeller. And he actually, it's called Weapons of Mass Instruction. And he actually shows cards and things that were printed in 1900 circulating around the committee that's been buried in the archives and would never be seen. But he actually has things in print you can see with your own eyes that say things like, one of the main purposes of public education is to make sure a child never learns to trust himself. And that parents and their children never get to trust each other either. So the whole thing is just to turn kids, you know, into donkeys and mules that can be, you know, particularly manipulated and then no creativity or self-confidence because they might be a threat to the money making of the 1%. And uh, I'm getting back to. Did you have a, a question? Yeah, I'm. Uh, the, the, the main, the main from, thing from is someone. about after reading a couple of hundred books on education, it all comes down to one basic thing. By the time a person, a child is five years old, your personality, your character, the story you end up telling yourself for the rest of your life has imprinted. Just the way Oprah Winfrey, you know, like, there's something wrong with me, I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable. And that's the story you carry yourself around for the rest of your life. So my whole point is if we gave children, it's particularly the ages of three, four, and five, as Plato said, a little love, nurturing, and encouragement, the acorn theory, everything is in us from the time we're born. Just let it grow and develop. So there are a couple of things I that I want to get your reaction to. I'll be quiet. No, no, no. I think you have a total agreement on that. I mean, I think we yeah. are all interested in that early, those early... I've even asked the people who run Columbia Teachers College if they know the etymology and original meaning of the word intelligence. None of them have known. Intelli means between, legere, the other half means to choose. Intelligence means to choose between. So what I'm trying to say is that if people were encouraged to know, you know, that they would be the best teachers, particularly parents, encourage it that they'll ever have. And it was placed on because nobody has any scientific evidence. So there's an amazing book. Have you ever heard of Peter Senge? So I just want to insert. Just wait, uh, wait a second. I'll be finished. Wait, let, let, it, let, okay. her, let yes. her answer. So I'm just trying to take something um, small from what you said and comment on it. And that is, uh, we know from the Perry Preschool Experiment, which is giving three, three and four-year-olds really an excellent preschool experience, uh, that, going back to family structure, there are profound impacts on family structure sure. 40 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we're back to Jim Hackman, I guess. Excellent. Um, anybody I anyone just want else? To say that I think if you could share the that mic, That community though, could be the center and schools could be open Thanks. on the week, weekends and third into community meeting centers where people of all ages could meet and come together. Actually, that's okay. in Kathy's book. You know, she was saying, open up the libraries, open up the public spaces. Anybody else have a question in the back there? There we go. Thank you, though, for, the, for your comments. Thank you. Hi, thank you, the panel, for the amazing presentation so far. So I have a quick question on the child credit, child tax credit system you, you mentioned a lot. So first of all, I think it's a very bizarre nature of it that is kind of a reverse means tested. If you are earning too little, the full credit won't be available to you. So actually, it's means tested towards the wealthier, and also it prioritizes the married couple against the single parents, uh, which is weird. And also, uh, in a, and let's bear in mind that the Congress, which is controlled by the Republicans right now, chose to let the expansion pack expire. And when, you, when the panelists are mentioning the regions that are most affected by the child poverty, I can't help but think they sound like the regions who is more likely to vote Republicans. And I was wondering what would be your take on that. Thank you. 
No, sure. The, thanks, thanks for the question. Uh, you used the word weird a couple times, and I think it's the perfect description of the, uh, the American tax and transfer system. It's quite weird. And uh, as you pointed out, uh, it's not designed to, to provide the most support for those who are most in need. Instead, it's designed to provide the most support for those who can cling on to low-wage jobs for long enough to get a little bit of a top-up and then be pushed from just under the poverty line to just, just over the poverty line. But as Kathy has shown quite vividly in, in her work, and with, with Luke in particular, and with Tim as well, that's leaving behind a whole portion of the population at the bottom of the income distribution that is struggling mightily to get by as a result of these direct policy changes that we've made. But let me comment on, on one other part real quick, because you mentioned uh, Republicans and, and control of Congress, and maybe this isn't why we have the child tax credit today. I want to make sure that if we're going to talk politics, we don't let Democrats off the hook either. So Build Back Better, the policy agenda from the Biden administration, uh, included a, an extension of this child tax credit that worked in 2021, by all accounts, I would say. And reportedly, uh, never got to a vote, but was about one or two votes shy. Uh, due to one or two Democratic senators not being willing to back it. I want to make sure it's clear that welfare reform came under a Democratic president, and the program was left defunct for multiple uh, Democratic administrations after that. Uh, so, you know, it's true that the odds of something like this occurring are stronger when Democrats have power, uh, but also it's not the case that when Democrats have had power, they prioritize these types of policies. Same if we talk about the minimum wage or a number of other policies that might do more to benefit these groups who have been left out of the tax and transfer system as currently designed. Could I add a sentence to that, though? Not all yes. Democrats. Not all Democrats have dropped the ball. Uh, I miss that. Not all Democrats are one. Democrats have dropped the ball. They certainly have recently. But I will just remind people way back when Al Gore, remember him? He ran on uh, universal pre-K and putting wages on the family and medical leave on. And if he had uh, become president, I'd like to say won the presidency, if he'd become <laughs> he become president, I think those two things would have happened, and they would have been revolutionary. So I agree that recently there have been a lot of disappointment, but mm. some of the Democrats have <coughs> And some of them are not even Democrats anymore, right? <laughs> but the, uh, there's over here a question. Thank, uh, thank you so much uh, for the panel and the great discussion. I also had a follow-up question on the lessons that we could learn uh, for, uh, from the expansion of the child credit during the COVID time. Uh, you mentioned that the eligibility criteria was uh, expanded to include uh, unemployed, if I understood. So, um, so that's the first thing that calls my attention, like to improve the coverage, like the eligibility criteria w was improved. Uh, second, I wonder if there was uh, the means tested uh, checked during the pandemic or it was only based on the eligibility criteria and uh, if there are estimates of the fiscal cost and potential simulations of, like you mentioned, like uh, discussions of how could this be financed going forward, uh, if there have been discussions, uh, if this could be financed, rationalizing some other public spending or uh, some potential taxes. Uh, thank you. Okay. Zach? Uh, and thanks for, for the question. Uh, on the first point, you're exactly right. So typically the way this policy works is that unless you are working and earning a sufficient amount throughout the year, you are not eligible to receive the maximum value of that credit. And if you're not working and not earning throughout the year, you get nothing from that policy. That was changed temporarily during the pandemic so that uh, we call it fully refundable, but essentially it made it available to all families with children under a certain income limit, regardless of their earnings status or their employment status. And that part of the policy change, more than a couple other changes that were made, made the strongest dent in child poverty. But the benefits went very high up the income level. Uh, Luke Schaefer, our co-author, has his, um, his benefit check taped to his, or pinned to his you know, door. So it, it, it is one of these policies that looks virtually uh, exactly. They, I think even Zach, you've described it as totally upside down, you know, who we're talking about. I mean, then there's the, the, the concept of uh, baby bonds, guaranteed income at birth. Uh, uh, let's just, and a lot of philanthropists now are actually, you know, Holly Fogel in the Bridge Project, she's dedicated $35 million to babies, mothers and babies in New York City and is uh, 
you know, taking that across the country. And what I love about it, it, it really is my philosophy, ask as few questions as possible and give as much money as possible uh, and let, uh, you know, people uh, raise their, help them raise their children. And it is affordable. As Jeff, you know, who, if he were here, he would, be, he would say to us, put a number on it. Don't shy away from the number of what it's going to cost to take care of our children. And once we have the number, we'll probably realize it's not that bad. I mean, just one story. Um, speaking of our co-author, Luke Schaefer, uh, he and an amazing pediatrician from Flint, uh, Mona, oh, I'm sorry, her last name. I apologize, Mona, uh, have uh, teamed up to end uh, uh, maternal and infant uh, child poverty in, in Flint. And uh, they've done it with a combination of, of TANF dollars. You can actually spend your some of your TANF block grant on this and philanthropy. Um, we're, you know, interested in trying to bring this idea to New Jersey. Uh, there are ways of doing this on the state level, on the, on the, munis on the municipal level, um, that require passion and, and creativity, but uh, they are not... Um, they're, as you say, this is not impossible. I know. The beauty about Luke's program, too, is that it starts uh, during the pregnancy. So it's $1,500 to every pregnant woman. This is in Flint, Michigan. And then $500 a month. And it's, uh, again, based on, you know, not reams of paperwork that you have to fill out, you know, I mean, which is, a, 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 you know, a total obstacle. I should give somebody a question, too. <laughs> uh, one more question. And then, then we'll have to close it out. Hi. Uh, I was going to jump off the question that uh, Professor Gornick uh, suggested at the beginning about uh, relative versus absolute poverty lines. Uh, my understanding is that a big critique of relative poverty lines is that uh, they're essentially inequality measures. They're not uh, a poverty measure, as people would think intuitively. Um, and then also, if anybody wants to talk about time poverty, which you kind of touched on a little bit in your discussions without naming explicitly. Did I'm, you say time poverty? Yeah, yeah, I think that would be interesting how that intersects with child poverty. Thanks. Well, there is a lot to say to that. It, what Relative poverty, I mean, it, it's a measure of inequality, but it, it's also a poverty measure, I guess I would say. I mean, it's, it's a, just a slightly different concept. I, I think, I mean, we could talk a lot about poverty measurement. It's been much debated. I, frankly, I think a lot of the debates about poverty measurement are ways to get around facing the high levels of poverty in this country. But um, the real, actually, the uh, absolute poverty line in the U.S. falls at somewhere around 35% of the median, meaning that our absolute poverty line is way below our relative poverty line. Uh, which is one reason that in the U.S. people don't realize how high our poverty rates are across countries. So measurement matters. It's something we've all talked about um, uh, quite a bit. But I think, um, and you know, the reality is, if I could just say this too, poverty and inequality are, are deeply intertwined. I mean, this is, again, a, a huge generalization, but I, I've spent a lot of the last literally 35 years working um, in, in Europe, and um, it's often said, you know, it was said many years ago, uh, Europeans were interested in inequality while Americans were interested only in poverty. Um, and I think that that's true. There is something, you know, we, there is a consensus, you know, to, we need to put a floor under the poorest of the poor. Um, but the debates about inequality started many, many decades earlier. That has shifted, you know, in the last 15 years. But they're deeply intertwined. To think about poverty and inequality as separate from one another, I think, is really not, it's just not helpful. The same policies that bring up the bottom, of course, reduce inequality. Um, we have... I just have to say one more time, we got to focus on the labor market. People really don't quite realize that. We measure across countries the percentage of people who earn less than two-thirds of median earnings, the low-wage labor market. That's almost a quarter of American workers. That's also in the low teens and single digits in other countries. So people in this country are working really hard um, for earnings that just literally do not bring them up to... Um, to, to, pov to the poverty line, and that's just absolutely true. And if we keep talking about taxes and transfers and welfare, we're going to miss the fact that we have a, a labor market that's, that's a big part of the story. If I may add one very quick point on, on the poverty measurement part. If we're looking at trends over the last four years, say just before the pandemic to today, uh, the trends, whether you look at a purely relative measure, something called a quasi-relative measure, like the supplemental poverty measure, or an absolute poverty measure look almost identical. The levels are different. There's a million reasons they differ in general. You could debate the pros and cons of each. But the general story of a decline in poverty during the pandemic as a result of these policies and then the rebound in 2022 is really consistent across each of these, which I think speaks to the real magnitude of this problem and the policies driving it. And the hardships go the same way exactly. during this period. 
They go way down and rebound. I have a, a goddaughter who lives uh, in Europe and who has a much easier time with uh, insurance and childcare, and her husband gets a month of vacation, paid time and a half. And, and she said, you know the difference of living here and there is that there, I actually feel loved. I actually feel cared for. I actually feel like I am a part of the society. In this country, I feel like I'm an enemy. You know, that has to be managed somehow. And so I think that that, you know, as we close out in terms of, you know, if that's how we feel as adults, uh, you know, capable of making our way in the world and we know when we're not wanted or cared for, uh, just think about how our children, uh, you know, who are scrambling for food, uh, living on the streets, uh, not going to school at all, uh, all of those kinds of things that we can fix uh, once we fix this problem of child poverty and of actually getting cash support, getting support to their families. Um, I want to thank uh, my you know, esteemed panelists for being uh, just phenomenal. And thanks to you all here and for all of you all out there watching as well and uh, to the CUNY Grad Center, thanks for this opportunity to talk about the future of our country and what child poverty is doing to it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Carol.